this message is the, is the last message I'm preaching in this convention. And I want everybody to understand that by the time the message is over, you know, and you could decide where you are spending eternity, what part of eternity you want to go. I believe in my spirit that the Holy Spirit is doing his best through my voice and dedication to bring to you in this convention the mind of God, that we do not live carelessly at this end time. The end is there. Prophecies have been daily fulfilled. People are dying recklessly like chickens. We hear bad news every day as we wake up into a new day. So also we keep experiencing mind-boggling you know, scenarios that we wonder if those things could ever be possible if we have been told or hinted several years back. This is my last message. And I pray that as you hear this message, God will help you to amend your way, to rededicate yourself and come back to the foot of the cross before it becomes too late. Let's pray. Father, I beg of you in your highness that this message will produce fruit, eternal fruit in the lives, in the ears, and the hearts of everyone. Thank you because this is not going to be a useless message. It won't be a fun, fair kind of message. Make it a deep, unforgettable, life-changing message indeed. In Jesus' name, I pray. My heart is bleeding. My face is wet with tears. Because I know what is going to befall this world immediately after the rapture. The theme of this year's convention is still the time is short. The time is short. The Bible says and that knowing the time, we need to know the time. What is the spiritual time ticking? Where is the spiritual time leading us? What explanation, what categorization, simplification can we make from the ticking of the end timing? The clock of the end time is ticking and is ticking fast. Only a true, a watchful and a dedicated believer will take time out to find out where his life is in the scheme of God's acceptability in the journey to eternity. I'm sure you understand it is a journey of no return. Once you embark on this journey, you are not coming back to this world again. Learn lessons from those who have gone ahead of you so that you do not end up your life the way they ended up theirs. God is giving you uncommon privilege in this message to right your wrongs, to go out of your way in placing him via the help of the Holy Ghost. Where will you be? And how is it going to be on that day when in glory your name is mentioned? But you are found condemned, deformed, and disqualified. The time is short. The world is gradually coming to an end according to the word of God. We are practically living at the very brink of eternity. And at any moment from now, Jesus will appear to take us home. This is the hope in Christ that I have come to renew in your mind in this message as a preacher. My conscience is alive. My conscience steers me up to remind you again that the time left 
for you and I to prepare adequately for eternity is extremely small, too small, very fragile, so inconsequential and negligible. Therefore, we must awake out of spiritual sluggishness, out of spiritual laziness, out of the spiritual like a dasicality, out of the spiritual bankruptcy. We must awake unto righteousness as commanded and admonished in the scriptures. Let us remain awakened and sleep no more. The master is coming in a GV and he mustn't appear and meet us defied, deformed, and disqualified. I'm sounding the note of warning. This is the time to put our house in order. Because grace is practically doing the last minute supervision before the trumpet will ever sound. And if the trumpet should sound, I want to ask you, O oh careless believer, where will you be? What are you doing to your soul in secret? Remember, where nobody is, God is there. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Will you answer yes, Lord, in glory when your name is finally mentioned? Or will you be somewhere sobbing in shame, in regret, in hell because you are left behind? Don't be left behind. Don't be left behind. Don't be caught unaware. Don't ruin your last minute grace. Wake up. Wake up. This period of time in a Christian journey and be likened to the time of Noah and Lot in Sodom. God's warning lovingly came to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, but they chose to ignore the warning of God. You see, Noah, the preacher of righteousness in Sodom and Gomorrah, preached and warned the people every day for a tap for a uh, 120 years, yes, 120 years. Waking up in the morning, preaching, the, preaching to them, warning the people, asking them to turn to God and stop idol worship and stop fornication and stop homosexuality and stop lesbianism and stop all this uh, barbaric killing. In their midst at that time. You see, whatever you are witnessing as society today has always been. Humanity cannot change because the devil will never change. There will never be a time the devil will become good. There will never be a time sin will be acceptable in the sight of God. There will never be a time that God will pardon the sinner that refuses to repent until he dies. When you repent, you'll be forgiven. Failure to repent will earn you eternal damnation, regret, and gnashing of teeth in the lake of fire, where their worm dies no more, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm not trying to make you afraid. I'm telling you what lies ahead of you that you must understand and face it now. In this world, we are writing spiritual exams, but it pays and it is better for you to know under the spiritual leader in which you are writing the spiritual exam, lest you fail when amendment will be eternally impossible. Noah, the preacher of righteousness, preached and warned the people for 120 years, yet the people perished. Yet, those people were buying and selling. They were building houses and acquiring properties endlessly. You know, the more Noah warned the people, the more they mocked him. The more Noah preaches, the deeper the atrocities and immoral proclivities of the Sodomite. You see, in their deluded mind and thought, they were undoing the preacher according to them. But suddenly, God who works according to his syllabus and timetable began to unfold his agenda for Sodom and Gomorrah, the then world. Unfortunately, the Sodomite 
and the people of Gomorrah weren't prepared, they all perished. Likewise, in the time of Lot, despite the fact that the angels slept overnight in their house and even leaked out the impending doom of Sodomite to Mrs. Lot and her entire family before they went to bed, yet Mrs. Lot couldn't make it. If you look at the universal world around us today, what do you notice? You notice that there is no disparity between what the damn world did to Noah, to, to Lot, and what the current world is doing to the church of the living God today. It's all the same. You know why? The storyline is the same. Satan will never change. Satan has never changed. His, his devices are intact. His focus unchanged. His determination undivided. His motive very shrewd. And Satan will stop at nothing in bringing, you know, the carefree believer into her. He will stop at nothing. My candid advice to you as a child of God who can reason with a reasonable God who listens to, you know, mind-boggling, life-changing messages like this. You are fond of listening to holiness messages, righteousness messages, messages that will transform your life and bring you closer to God. You are formed of listening to them. Do not stop listening to them. My candid advice to you as a believer of this category is that you must run away from this viper. The devil is a viper. He's not a friend. Sin is a viper. Sin is not a friend. Sin is deadlier than cancer. As a child of God, run away from the devil. Don't look at his offer. He has nothing good to offer you. He may pretend to love you. He may pretend to care for you. He wants to care for you in exchange of your soul. It's all fake. It's all deadly. He wants to trap your soul exactly the way he did to the biblical fallen heroes. The time is short. Therefore, wake up fast from slumber. Wake up to spiritual duty. Wake up to evangelism and so winning. Effective personal devotion. Ardent commitment in the food. Curious continuous praying. Wake out of the spiritual slumber. Wake up out of the spiritual slumber. Wake up from your backsliding. Wake up from carelessness and procrastination. Do what you ought to do today and do it better. And whatever you are doing better today, be at best on it tomorrow. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up from the spiritual grief and drowsiness. Wake up to fresh discipleship. Wake up to devotion. Wake up to meditation. And wake up to regeneration. This is the mind of God for you at this end time as a believer. Wake up, don't sleep. We do not have much time left again. Wake up to some teachings of God's word. Wake up to personal scriptural application. Stop minding other people. Begin to mind yourself. Concentrate the greater percentage of your time on your spiritual modification, spiritual regeneration, spiritual reconciliation. Ensuring your name remains in the book of life because it's going to be terrific and hazardous to those who will die in church with no name in the book of life. Don't let this happen to you, child of God. Wake up to eternal matters, eternal realities, eternal revolution, eternal information, eternal fortification, eternal rectification. Wake up to deeper commitment in Christ. It is time to wake up. Wake up to unusual obedience and loyalty to Christ. I want to ask you and I want to help you that you should set up, set up for yourself spiritual markings that will help you 
try to have a spiritual timetable that will help you. In so doing, you will be setting your affection on things above and not on things on earth, according to Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 17. I divide the message into three parts very, very briefly. Number one, how do we know that the time is? Is short. When we talk about the shortness of the time, we are simply referring to the sudden appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ to cut the believers away into their zoar above. That the trumpet will sound, will leave this world, and the world will know that indeed some people have left because life will never remain the same for them. The moment the believers are taken away from this world, things will turn automatically upside down for them. The wrath of God, the plague of God, the punishment of God, the indignation of God, the fierceness of God will be unleashed on the world. Please, my friend, as you listen to this message, run for your life, run for your soul, escape for your dear life, and stop looking back. Point number two, the moment you close your eyes in death, what happens? Wait a minute, I'm coming to tell you. Point number three, if you die in sin, Ah, if you die in sin, you will die again. If you die in Jesus, you will die no more. If I die in sin, I will die again. If I die in Jesus, I will die no more. Don't die in sin because if you die in sin, your sin will definitely find you out. Let's go back to point one. How do we know that the time is short? We know about the shortness of this time to the sudden appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in the firmament by Jesus' predictions that are getting fulfilled every time, every day. Jesus actually predicted about the time we are in right now. Right now. If you're a Bible student, you understand. If you belong to a Bible-believing church where your pastor is actually running the race to heaven and not a race to abroad, not a race to getting money, and earthly mundane things, the ephemerals. If your pastor is actually running the race as stipulated in the Bible, you will understand the concept and the spiritual implication, application, and explanation of this time. When you look at the gross departure from the faith, many people are backsliding from the faith. You understand that the time is short. There is increase of false preachers. If you check the internet, you see false teachers, false, false pastors, false apostles, false prophets, false bishops, false teachers, false evangelists, false preachers with false and fake devilish practices that are too shameful for me to mention. Check the internet. You see them. It's one of the moments, one of the living proof that the end is there. The end is there. Everything can turn upside down any moment from now as Jesus appears in the sky. The time is short because believers' persecution, it has its highest crescendo. The time is short. Everywhere believers have been persecuted. Fake Jesus had reason. I'm amazed that people, somebody can just get up and say, he is Jesus. He is Jesus. Some will say he's much more powerful than Jesus. Some will say that he is a redeemer, that he is the one the Holy Ghost tells he is coming. A lot of model of and spiritual perversions. Globally, is happening today. Is happening today. We know the time is short because of the irreverent abuse of God. People talk trash to God as if God is powerless. No, God is keeping it cool for you. This is your time. God's time is coming. 
hatred for the truth. You preach the truth, you won't see anybody in the church again. There will be no money to run the radio program, the television program, because of the truth. But God is doing it. I've always been like this. God has been doing it. Our TV program, radio program will not stop because God is doing it. He's doing it to the glory and honor of his name. And we want to spread to other stations. We even want to go to the to the end to the you know cables now to the glory and honor of his name. The time is short because we hear heartbreaking news every day. Man in humanity to man. Terrible hostility against the Christians. Deliberate entrances to the spread of the gospel. It's everywhere. We see loss of spiritual appetite. Everywhere in so many churches, on our street, in our society, within the governmental circle, we see sin justification, sin celebration, sin modification, sin exhortation, sin simplifying, and dregs on the altar. All these things are there, and they are bringing to us that the time is short. I want to counsel you as a child of God who doesn't want to miss the rapture, to spend more time with your Bible, spend more time in prayer, in meditation, spend more time in His presence, and spend much more time examining yourself. Examining yourself. Spend much more time examining yourself. The time is short. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 1 to 7. 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 1 to 7. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, healthy, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are the which creep at the which a day which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, reading there from verse 1. Apostle Peter said, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For these they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heaven were of old, and the earth standing out of the water in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as, as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us world, and uh, not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall met with fervent heat. The earth also and the worlds that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and the hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall met with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, looking for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwell to righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, the diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blemish, and uh, and uh, account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him had written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they are which they that are on land and unstable rest, that is, they twist, they misinterpret. They misrepresent because they lack spiritual understanding. Holy Ghost is not in them. They don't know God by experience. They don't know God experientially. They don't know God by relationship. They don't know God by devotion and commitment. They don't know God through loyalty and obedience. They don't know God by moving with him through intimacy. They rest the word of God. They twist the word of God. They misinterpret the word of God. They subtract from the the word of God. They make like the word of God. Are you like that? Are you like that? The Bible says they do those things, you know, to the other scriptures and they are doing it to their destruction. Let me stop in verse 17. Ye therefore, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked. Fall from your own steadfastness. Did you hear that? You must not fall from your own steadfastness. Point number two. The moment you close your eyes in debt. Number one. Your own grace has ended. Number two. Your own door of mercy has closed. Number three. You can never repent again. The moment you close your eyes to death. Number four, no more second chance for you. No more second chance for you. The moment you close your eyes in death, look at this fearful statement I want to make. Once you die, the clock of your eternal placement starts ticking. It will be ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking, and ticking fearfully. And you can't change it. Of course not. You can't change it. The moment you, you close your eyes to death, you lose total control over yourself. You can't control yourself again. You can't do your will anymore. The realities of eternity will dawn on you. You will see God's other side that so many pastors are hiding away from you. All along the years you have spent in your church, they kept on telling you, God is love, God is kind, God is gracious, God is merciful. They are very much correct, but they have not shown you the terrible aspect of God. They refuse to let you know that God is terrible in nature. And they didn't tell you that God is a consuming fire. How do you reconcile the two? Somebody who is loving is also is consuming fire. Study the word of God in a church where your pastor is running to heaven. Where your pastor is wanting to make heaven at all costs. Where your pastor, in fact, is already living the life of heaven on earth. That's the church you need to study the word of God from. Don't, don't, don't get stuck up in the church, in the ministry, 
don't get stuck up in anywhere they call fellowship where they don't teach you the balanced diet word of God. They have killed you. Your case is like somebody who has been killed, embalmed, and is awaiting the final barrier. Don't live as an obituary while you are still breathing. It's possible spiritually. You will be blind, you will be naked, you will be wretched, you will be poor. You won't be able to distinguish between the holy and the profane because you study the word of God under a substandard church. Because to me, any church that has failed to declare the whole counsel of God to its members is a substandard church. If there is no church at all, it's a cinema house. Quote me anywhere. No apology on this. The primary reason for church establishment is to teach the people to love God, to fear God, to serve Him, and be ready for eternity. Ready for eternity. The moment you close your eyes to death, your judgment is already decided before appearing at the judgment, at the judgment seat. Your judgment has been decided already. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, after that, the judgment. Point number three, if you die in sin, this is the cruise of the matter. Don't die in sin. Numbers 32, 23 tells us your sin will find you out. That's the big part that I want to make use of. Your sin will find you out. You cannot hide it from God. You cannot hide it from God. You cannot hide it from God. You may cover your sin that nobody should know. You cannot hide it from God. You can never hide it from God. You may cover your sin in order for people not to see, not to know and say, Hey, so you, this is who you are, brother, sister, pastor, general overseer, bishop. So this is who you are. Cover it. Cover it. The time is coming that eternity will uncover what we've been covering. Eternity will throw it open. Don't forget that we are surrounded with cloud of evidences. And they are taking records of our wealth, of our lifestyle on a daily basis, everywhere we are. It will surprise you when eternity you come and discover that God has time to to, to give you the details of your life. God has your details in his hand, in his palm. If you die in sin, I want to beg you and advise you in the name of the Lord as you strive hard via the grace of God never to die in sin. No. Don't die in sin. No. I'm begging you, don't die in sin. No. If you have to beg the Holy Spirit for help, for assistance and much more grace in this matter, you better do. You better do. This matter I'm bringing to you, don't handle it with a kick glove so, Because it is a serious matter. In fact, the matter of sin is much more serious than any other matter in the world. It has taken kings, priests, pastors, bishops, archbishops, prophets, presidents, and governors. Eminent important personalities. Sin has taken them to hell. So who are you? Who am I? Don't fall victims. God loves you. It's a serious matter. The matter of sin is a matter between life and death. It's a matter between glory and shame, between rest and trouble, between laughter and sadness, between peace and agony, between celebration and condemnation. It's a matter between eternal, eternal life and eternal perdition. Eternal bad partition. Don't die in sin. If you die in sin, you are in trouble eternally. You are lost forever. There is no more remedy for you anywhere anymore. If you die in sin, you will regret it eternally. You will not see God's face on the last day. If you die in sin, you are 
doomed endlessly. If you die in sin, your eternal punishment begins fully. The day you die in sin, there is no more remission for your sins and grace of God has failed you. The mercy of God has failed you. If you die in sin, grace for salvation ends. You will reap the fruit of your sin in hellfire. If you die in sin, the venom of sin will not forgive you in hell. If you die in sin, your joy ends, your peace ends, your doubt ends, your argument ends, your laughter ends, your sorrow begins endlessly. If you die in sin, there is no more second chance for you. If you die in sin, no more assistance from heaven for you. Heaven can help you again. If you die in sin, your part and that of God can never cross again. God's part and yours shall never cross again if you die in sin. If you die in sin, prepare to have agony, regret, and tears as your companion in hell because the gate of heaven has closed permanently against your soul if you die in sin. As I close, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1. Cry aloud, spear not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and their house of Jacob their sins. I have shown you, run for your dear life, escape for your life, ensure you have a name in the book of life before you die or before the trumpet sounds. If you don't want to weep endlessly, in the lake of fire where you've been gnashing your teeth, there will be no remedy, there will be no grace, there will be no promise, there will be no mercy, and uh, you will never be able to get out of it anymore. You will be bonny and bonny, and your body will never annihilate. Think about it.